It's Friday! That's very exciting. I'm feeling really, really good today, you guys. I slept really well last night. When I was making my coffee for myself, I just realized, oh, just spilled, just spilled all this holy blessing all over me. Um, yeah, I realized I didn't really hate my life anymore. That was pretty exciting. Okay, let's get into it. Hi, guys. It's me. I'm Lovejoy. I'm here with you. This is my, this is our, this is supposed to be our space. If it's just me right now, that's fine. Um, but this is our Queer Spiritual Book Club where we can just come together and be ourselves and just kind of get some energetic collective movement going on right here and create that beautiful bright world that we all know and love that exists. So just come with me in this moment. I still have coffee on my titties. Um, <laughs> come with me in this moment and uh, let's just have a little collective breath so that way we are all here intentionally together. On the count of three. One, two, three and hold all of this yummy collective energy and release it. <sighs> all right, thank you so much for being here with me. We're gonna start with the Sass Tarot deck. As I mentioned before, my friend Katie and I made this deck together because I didn't understand tarot and I just wanted something that screamed the answers at me. So, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for being here with me, with us, with all of us here in this moment. What type of message do you have for us today on this wonderful, glorious, warm Friday? It is very warm for a Friday near Seattle. All right, here we go. We got Buddy. There is no I in team. That is accurate. I cannot do this alone. There's no point in me living life by myself. That humans were not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to be in community with each other. And then we got wake up, put a smile on, and fucking get pumped for something, babe. If this isn't the energy of today, I don't know what is. All right, this is amazing. I love you. All right, so we did that. Um, we are also, so as I kind of mentioned, um, I am a, I was raised in a very, conservative, strict evangelical household. And uh, <laughs> I am none of those things. Um, but faith is really, really important to me. Connection with the divine and with spirit is really, really important to me. And I think queer faith is the most important thing of all in the entire freaking universe. Um, because if you want to, if you want to understand my thoughts and beliefs and heart behind this, please go binge the queer magic, uh, playlist. It's the one right before this one. Um, and that will show you, and, and, and we go through the book Queer Magic by Thomas Prower, and that will explain the, of, of what the connection between, that the queer people are, we are, between the divine and the humane. So that's what queer magic is. We're going to get started. We're going to just read a passage from the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Um, these are passage from scriptures that were written um, during the biblical era that were not included in our modern texts. They were hidden in the Dead Sea Scrolls and found by a little boy, uh, I think maybe in the 80s or the 90s. It was really recent. Um, and he sold all the fragment scriptures in a marketplace and, and you know, because life. Um, so we are reading an excerpt from Plato's Republic. Okay. Cool. I don't know what that means exactly. But let's get into it. Okay. Excerpt from Plato's Republic. Introduced and translated by Marvin Meyer. The excerpt from Plato's Republic is the fifth tractate of Nag Hammadi Codex, the sixth, and provides a Coptic version of a portion of the parable of Socrates and Plato's Republic on the human soul. In the parable, Socrates compares the soul to a creature of three forms, a many-headed beast, a lion, and a human. The many-headed beast, Socrates suggests, stands for the lower passions, the lion for the higher passion of courage, and the human for reason. And the point of the parable is that the human, that is reason, should watch over and cultivate the various aspects of the soul. Hmm. 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 Very uh, multi-personality of you. <laughs> This passage from the Republic reads as follows in the English translation of the Greek by Benjamin Jowett. Well, I said, and now having arrived at this stage of the argument, we may revert to the words which brought us hither. Was not someone saying that injustice was, was a gain to the perfectly unjust who was reputed to be just? Okay, injustice is a positive to the unjust who have a reputation of being just. That makes sense. Okay. Yes, that was said. Now then, having determined the power and quality of justice and injustice, let us have a little conversation with him. What shall we say to him? 
let us make an image of the soul that he may have his own words presented before his eyes. Of what sort? An ideal image of the sword, soul, like the composite creations of ancient mythology, such as the Chimera or Skyla, Skyla, I've never said that correctly, or Cerberus. And there are many others in which two or more different natures are said to grow into one. There are said to have been such unions. Then, do you now model the form of a multi dionysus many-headed monster, having a ring of heads and all manner of beasts, tame and wild, which he is able to generate and metamorphosis at will? You suppose marvelous powers in this artist, but as language is more pliable than wax or any similar substance, let there be such a model as you propose. Suppose, now that you make a second form as of a lion, and a third of as a man, and a second smaller than the first, and the third smaller than the second. That, he said, is an easier task, and I have made them as you say. And now join them and let the three grow into one. Ooh, like the three in one, that like gods or the mother goddess, you know, the, the, the maiden, the matron and the crow. That's not really my wheelhouse. Um, I have done so. And now to him who maintains that it is profitable for the human creature to be unjust and unprofitable to be just, let us reply that if he be right, it is profitable for this creature to feast the multi dionysus monster and strengthen the lion in the lion-like qualities, but to starve and weaken the man, who is consequently liable to be dragged about at the mercy of either of the other two. And he has not the attempt to familiarize or harmonize them with one another. He ought rather to suffer them to fight and bite and devour one another. Certainly, he said, that is what the approver of injustice says. To him, the supporter of justice makes answer that he should ever so speak and act as to give the man within him some way or other the most complete mastery of the entire human creature. He should watch over the many-headed monster like a good husbandman, fostering and cultivating the gentle qualities and preventing the wild ones from growing. Okay, so I think this passage was about injustice and justice. And, and then here at the very end, it says the human in our, inside of ourselves needs to watch the monstrous qualities of ourselves. And then it says maintain it like a good husband, but like, bleh. um, and then we're supposed to foster and cultivate the gentle qualities while preventing the wild ones from growing. Okay, cool, great, we're all doing that. Um, a lot of mythic creature imagery is in my life right now. So that's pretty exciting. I love mythic creatures. Also, fun tip, um, I firmly believe that like queer neurodivergent people, well, like majority of neurodivergent people are also queer. And honestly, the majority of queer people are also neurodivergent. Um, I like to imagine us as like magical, powerful fey bloodlines um, that have been diluted with time. And we just are like calling back all our power. So that's what I was thinking. All right. The Coptic version of the excerpt from Plato's Republic has presented interesting challenges to the interpreters of the Nag Hammadi texts since it was first identified by Hans Martin Schnick. This section of the Republic was popular during the early centuries of the common area and is cited at, by Esibus of Caesarea in preparation for the gospel and alluded to by the Napolitanist authors Platonus and Proclus. It may well have been included in a handbook of quotations for students of philosophy in the world of late antiquity. antiquity. Schneck proposes that practitioners of hermetic religion may have found Plato particularly attractive and may have thought him a student of Hermes so that they could have associated the section of the Plato's Republic with other hermetic texts. And three such hermetic texts follow the expert from Plato's Republic in Nag Hammadi Codex 6. The Coptic expert from Plato's Republic differs from the Greek text in significant respects, and scholars have offered several explanations to account for the differences. Some have maintained that the Coptic translator misunderstood the Greek text. Others have judged that the differences reflects deliberate nuxtasizing tendencies on the part of the translator. Howard M. M. Jackson also refers to the incapability of the Coptic language to render the complexities and niceties of Plato's style. It is most likely that all of these considerations contributed to the state of the Coptic translation that has been transmitted in Codex 6 of the Nag Hammadi Library. It is apparent that upon occasion, the Coptic translator has misunderstood the Greek. At the same time, the text from Plato, with its emphasis upon images, the evil beast, the lion, the weakness of the human, and the need for the human being to act with injustice and strength, would have been very appealing to people with aesthetical or Gnosticizing proclivities. And the Coptic 
translation of the expert from Plato's Republic may have been emphasized these very points even more. As a result, the excerpt from Plato's Republic may be read profitably along with texts like the Secret Book of John, with its understanding of creation in the image of the divine, life in the cosmos of the lion-like demiurge, and salvation for humanity above and below through insight and knowledge. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, this really showed me, um, I never have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I didn't realize that Plato's works would be in this. So this weekend, I guess I'm going to do a little bit of research and homework since that's so fun. Alrighty, 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 alrighty. Okay, so we are here for the big meat and the potatoes, what we're actually here for, for which is a chapter of Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. This is a book that was written in 1930, no, 1993. Um, and it's a dystopia future novel that's kind of time like timeline placed after 1990, 1984, before Handmaid's Tale. It's more graphic than I usually read. I'm just, I'm putting this warning now before I start reading because I don't know what's coming in the chapters. Um, there has been mentions of literally everything traumatizing. If you think about it, it's probably been mentioned. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of rape. There's a lot of gore. For me, there's a lot for me. Um, so this is your warning. But we're all adults here. And there's important messages in here for us, for our future. It's about a 15-year-old girl living kind of outside of desolate LA. Um, the whole world is, has no water, is filled with trash and, and houseless people. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I totally, totally missed it. Okay, um, let's jump in. I do want to acknowledge um, the Pelliop and um, Nisqually tribes. Uh, that is whose land I am currently working and residing on. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge the past um, so that way we don't repeat the mistakes in the future. Um, and so just thank you to the coast Swat Solish, the coastal Solish people for taking care of this land and nurturing it <sighs> so that white people could have come in and destroyed it. But that's where we're recognizing that that happened because we don't want to repeat that in the future. It's important for us to take care of this beautiful planet that we live on. We are supposed to be stewards of this jewel. All right. We lost the text. We threw out the manual. There are people who are still actively fighting and working hard every single day to make sure that we are proper stewards of this planet. That is the people that we need to follow. So... Thank you. All right, let's get into the text now. Uh, we are now jumping into 2025. Um, there we go. All right. I'm on page like 30 something. Intelligence is ongoing. Individual adaptability. Adaptions that an intelligent species may make in a single generation, other species make over many generations of selective breeding and selective dying. Yet, intelligence is demanding. If it is misdirected by accident or by intent, it can foster its own orgies of breeding and dying. Earthseed, the books of the living. So I think Earthseed, the books of the living is like books that the main character girl is writing. She's 15 years old. And the theory is that she, uh, she starts her own religion. Um, so, and there's a sequel. There's a sequel to this. I don't know if I'll read it on here or if I'll read it on my Patreon channel. We will, we'll see. I, okay. Alrighty. Chapter four. A victim of God may, through learning adaptation, become a partner of God. A victim of God may, through forethought and planning, become a shaper of God. Or a victim of God may, through short-sightedness and fear, remain God's victim. God's plaything, God's prey. Earthseed, the books of the living. Saturday, February 1st, 2025. We had a fire today. People worry so much about fire, but the little kids will play with it if they can. We were lucky with this fire. Amy Dunn, three years old, managed to start it in her family's garage. Once the fire began to crawl up the wall, Amy got scared and ran into the house. She knew she had done something bad, so she didn't tell anyone. She hid under her grandmother's bed. Out back, the dry wood of the garage burned fast and hot. Robin Balter saw the smoke and rang the emergency bell on the island in our street. 
Robin's only 10, but she's a bright little kid. One of my stepmother's star students. She keeps her head. If she hadn't alerted people as soon as she saw the smoke, the fire would have spread. I heard the bell and ran out like everyone else to see what was wrong. The Duns live across the street from us, so I couldn't miss the smoke. The fire plan worked the way it was supposed to. The adult men and women put the fire out with garden hoses, shovels, wet towels, and blankets. Those without hoses beat at the edge of the fire and smothered them with dirt. Kids my age helped out where we were needed and put out any new fire started by flying embers. We brought buckets with the water to fill with water, shovels, and blankets and towels of our own. There were a lot of us, and we kept our eyes open. The very old people watched the little kids and kept them out of the way and out of trouble. So before we had uh, modern fire departments, it was a community effort. Fire departments came about as, as a response to the community effort. Because uh, if there's a fire, one, it's very difficult to put out by yourself. And two, it affects everyone around you. Because the fire will catch on to other people's houses and burn their houses. So when we lived in a more communal mentality, it, it was expected and common that the whole neighborhood would rally together to make sure to put a fire out. The world's on fire. I am working real hard. we got to rally our community to put this fire out. We shouldn't throw gasoline on it. We shouldn't throw gasoline on it. I know I posted that TikTok today, but we shouldn't throw gasoline on it. Okay. <sighs> no one missed Amy. No one had seen her in the Dunn backyard, so no one thought about her. Grandmother found her much later and got the truth out of her. The garage was a total loss. Edwin Dunn salvaged some of his garden and carpentry equipment, but not much. The grapefruit tree next to the garage and the two peach trees behind it were half burned too, but they might survive. The carrot, squash, collard, and potato plants were a trampled mess. Of course, no one called for the fire department. No one would take on fire service fees just to save an unoccupied garage. Most of our households couldn't afford another big bill anyway. The water wasted on putting out the fire was going to be hard enough to pay for. What will happen, I wonder, to poor little Amy Dunn? No one cares about her. Her family feeds her and now and then cleans her up, but they don't love her or even like her. Her mother, Tracy, is only a year older than I, than I am. She was 13 when Amy was born. She was 12 when... Oh. Sexual assault content warning if you want to cover your ears. It's only for one sentence. Okay, it's only for one sentence. She was 12 when her 27-year-old uncle, who had been raping her for years, managed to make her pregnant. Problem. Big problem. Big problem. Problem. Uncle Derek was a big, blonde, handsome guy. Funny and bright and well-liked. Tracy was, is, dull and homely, sulky and dirty looking. Even when she's clean, she looks splotchy, dirty. Some of her problems might have come from being raped by Uncle Derek for years. Uncle Derek was Tracy's mother's youngest brother, her favorite brother. But when people realized what he had been doing, the neighborhood men got together and suggested he go live somewhere else. People didn't want him around their daughters. Irrational as usual, Tracy's mother blamed Tracy for his exile and her own embarrassment. Not many Mary's girls in the neighborhood have babies before they drag some boy to my father and have them unite them in holy matrimony. But there was no one to marry Tracy and no money for prenatal care or an abortion. And poor Amy, as she grew, she looked more and more like Tracy, scrawny and splotchy with sparse, stringy hair. I don't think she'll ever be pretty. Tracy's maternal instincts didn't kick, it, kick in because she's a child, because she's a child. Her mother instincts are not supposed to kick in because she's a child. <sighs> And I doubt that her mother, Christmas Dunn, has any. Also, here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. The generations before us have clearly been traumatized. That's not a new concept to us. We're aware of this. We're also aware that they didn't have the understanding or the resources to get the help from the trauma that they needed or desired or wanted and so now that responsibility is following, follow, 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 falling, not following, falling onto us. 
And if they're still not in a place where they're able to take accountability, you don't need to have them in your life. The Dunn family has a reputation for craziness. There are 16 of them living in the Dunn house, and at least a third are nuts. Amy isn't crazy, though. Not yet. She's neglected and lonely, and like any little kid left on her own too much, she finds ways to amuse herself. I've never seen anyone hit Amy or curse her or anything like that. The Dunns do care what people think of them, but no one pays any attention to her either. She spends most of her time playing alone in the dirt. She also eats the dirt and whatever she finds in it, including bugs. But not long ago, just out of curiosity, I took her to her house, sponged her off, taught her the alphabet, and showed her how to, how to write her name. She loved it. She's got a hungry, able little mind, and she loves attention. Tonight, I asked Corey if Amy could start school early. Corey doesn't take kids until they're five or close to five, but she said she'd let Amy in if I would take charge of her. I accepted that, though I didn't like it. I help with the five and six-year-olds anyway. I've been taking care of little kids since I was one, and I'm tired of it. I think, oh, since I was one, there we go, and I'm tired of it. I think, though, that if someone doesn't help Amy now, someday she'll do a lot worse than burning down her family's garage. There's that quote, isn't there? The child who doesn't feel the village, the village's warmth will set it on fire. No. Something about children not feeling loved by the village and setting it on fire to feel its warmth. Wednesday, February 19th, 2025. Some co cousins of old Mrs. Sims have inherited her house. They're lucky there's still a house to inherit, and if it weren't for our wall, the house would have been gutted, taken over by squatters, or torched as soon as it was empty. As it was, all people d did was take things back... Blah, 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 blah. As it was, all people did was take back the things they had given to Mr. S Mrs. Sims after she was robbed, and take whatever food she had in the house. No sense letting it rot. We didn't take her furniture or rugs or her appliances. We could have, but we didn't. We aren't thieves. Wardle Parrish and Rosalie Pine think otherwise. They're both small, rust-brown, sour-looking people like Mrs. Sims. They're the children of the first cousin that Mrs. Sims had managed to keep contact and good relations with. He's a widower twice over, no kids, and she's been widowed once, seven kids. They're not only brother and sister, but twins. Maybe that helps them get along with each other. They damn sure won't get along with anyone else. They're moving in today. They've been here a couple times before to look the place over, and I guess they must have liked it better than their parents' house. They shared that with 18 other people. Whew, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of different energies. I was busy in the den with my class of younger school kids, so I didn't meet them until today. Though, I've heard Dad talking to them. Heard them sitting in our living room and insinuate that we had cleaned out Mrs. Sims' house before they arrived. Dad kept his temper. You know she was robbed during a month before she died, he said. You can check with the police about that if you haven't already. Since then, the community has protected the house. We haven't used it or stripped it. If you choose to live among us, you understand that. We help each other and we don't steal. I wouldn't expect you to say you did, Wardle, Wardle Parrish muttered. His sister jumped in before he could say more. We're not accusing anyone of anything, she lied. We just wondered... We knew Cousin Marjorie had some nice things. Jewelry that she inherited from her mother. Very valuable. Check with the police, my father said. Well, yes, I know, but this is a small community, my father said. We all know each other here. We depend on each other. There was silence. Perhaps the twins were getting the message. We're not very social, Wardle Parrish said. We mind our own business. Again, his sister jumped in before he could go on. I'm sure everything will be all right, she said. I'm sure we'll get along fine. I don't like them when I heard them. I liked them even less when I met them. They look at us as though we smell and they don't. Of course, it doesn't matter whether I like them or not, but there are some people in the neighborhood whom I don't like. But I don't trust the Pine Parishes. The kids seem all right, but the adults... I wouldn't want to have to depend on them, not even for little things. Pain and Parish. <laughs> what perfect names they have. And it's spelled P-A-Y-N-E and P-A-R-R-I-S-H. All right, let's see here. Okay. Saturday, February 22nd, 2025. I need to drink some water. 
I spent two and a half hours filming TikToks this morning. I'm trying to get together with some friends tomorrow. I'm trying to make friends and get together with them tomorrow. And I can tell my voice is tired. <laughs> Saturday, February 22nd, 2025. We ran, we, we ran into a pack of feral dogs today. We went to the hills today for parka practice. Me, my father, Joan Garfield, her cousin and boyfriend, Harold, Harry, Balter, my friend, my boyfriend, Curtis Talcott, his brother, Michael, Ora Moss, and her brother, Peter. Our other adult guardian was Joanne's father, Jay. He's a good guy and a good shot. Dad likes to work with him, although sometimes there are problems. The Garfields and the Balters are white. The rest of us are black. That can be dangerous these days. On the street, people are expected to fear and hate have everyone but their own kind. But with all of us armed and watchful, people stared, but they let us alone. Our neighborhood is too small for us to play those kinds of games. Everything went as usual as first. The Talcotts got into an argument with first with each other, then with the Moses, the Moseses, the, oh, the Mosses. The Mosses are always blaming other people for whatever they do wrong. So they tend to have disputes outstanding with most of us. Peter Moss is the worst because he's always trying to be like his father. And his father is a total shit. His father has three wives, all at once. Karen, Natalie, Zahara. They've all got kids by him, though so far, Zara is the youngest and the prettiest, only has one. Karen is the one with the marriage license, but she let him get away with bringing the first one, then another woman, new woman into the house and calling them his wives. I guess with the way things are, she didn't think she could make it on her own with three kids when he brought in Natalie, and the five by the time he found Zara. Being Polly doesn't inherently make you a shit, but uh, collecting people to use their energy and not have it be a reciprocal, happy, healthy, flowing life that meets everyone's needs. That's pretty shitty. The Mosses don't come to church. Richard Moss has put together his own religion, a combination of the Old Testament and historical West African practices. He claims that God wants men to be patriarchs, rulers, or protectors of women, and fathers of as many children as possible. He's an engineer for one of the big commercial water companies, so he can afford to pick up beautiful, young, homeless women and live with them in poly... Oh, here we go. Um, okay, so he's an engineer, so he can afford to be in a polygamous relationships. He could pick up 20 women like that if he could afford to feed them. I hear there's a lot of that kind of thing going on in other neighborhoods. I'm not looking forward to the future that Octavia Butler is describing. Um, some middle class men prove that they're men by having a lot of wives in temporary or permanent relationships. Some upper class men prove that they're men by having one wife and a lot of beautiful, disposable young serving girls. Nasty. No. <sighs> When the girls get pregnant, if their rich employers won't protect them, the employer wives throw them out to starve. Is that the way it's going to be, I wonder? Is that the future? Large numbers of people stuck in either President-elect Don uh, Donner's version of slavery or Richard Moss's? We rode our bikes to the top of River Street, past the last neighborhood walls, past the last ragged, unwalled houses, past the last stretch of broken asphalt and rag and stick shacks of squatters and street poor who stare at us in their horrible, empty way, and then higher into the hills along a dirt road. At last, we dismounted and walked our bikes down the narrow trail into one of the canyons that we and the others used for target practice. It looked all right this time, but we always have to be careful. People use canyons for a lot of things. If we find corpses in one, we stay away from it for a while. Dad tries to shield us from what goes on in the world, but he can't. Knowing that, he also tries to teach us to shield ourselves. Do you guys know how to do mental shielding? Mental protective shielding? Okay, quick tip. You can do it in a lot of different ways, but the idea is that you're creating a case around yourself. Um, my friend Katie likes to imagine a rain jacket, like a rain slicker, so that everything just like slicks right off of her. I personally like to imagine, oh, it used to be a bubble, but bubbles are fragile. I now like to imagine a geode um, to around me, uh, protecting bad 
negative influences from getting in, but still allowing. It started also as an egg. I also like the imagery of an egg because it's porous, but also solid. Um, so with egg imagery, uh, it, it keeps the bad stuff out, but it allows all that yummy goodness, all that fresh air. I think eggs are porous. I'm doubting myself now. Anyway, to get in, or I also like to imagine the yummy, my yummy goodness getting out of the egg. Um, but yeah, you can practice mental shielding doing it. Uh, if you ever have to have a conversation with someone that you're not looking forward to, definitely put up a mental shield before you do it. But it's really, really important to protect yourself. Most of us have practiced at home with BB guns on homemade targets or on a squirrel and bird targets. I've done all that. My aim is good, but I don't like it with the birds and squirrels. Dad was the one who insisted on my learning to shoot them. He said moving targets would be good for my aim. I think there was more to it than that. I think he wanted to see whether or not I could do it. Whether shooting a bird or a squirrel would trigger my hyper empathy. It didn't quite. I didn't like it, but it wasn't painful. It felt like a big, soft, strange ghost blow, like getting hit with a huge ball of air, but with no coolness, no feeling of wind. The blow, though, was still soft, it was a little harder with squirrels, sometimes rats than with birds. All three had to be killed, though. They ate our food or ruined it. Tree crops were their special victims. Peaches, plums, figs, persimmons, nuts. And crops like strawberries, blackberries, grapes. Whatever we planted, if they could get at it, they would. Birds are particular pests because they can fly in, yet I like them. I envy their ability to fly. Sometimes I get up and go out at dawn just so I can watch them without scaring any, without scaring them or shooting them. Now that I'm old enough to go target shooting on Saturdays, I don't intend to shoot any more birds, no matter what dad says. Because I just, besides, just because I can shoot a bird or a squirrel doesn't mean I could shoot a person. A thief like the ones who robbed Mrs. Sims? I don't know whether I could do that. And if I did, I don't know what happened to me. Would I die? It's my father's fault we have to pay so much attention to guns and shooting. He carries a 9mm automatic pistol whenever he leaves the neighborhood. He carries it on his hip where people can see it. He says that discourages mistakes. Armed people do get killed, most often in crossfires or by snipers. But unarmed people get killed a lot more often. Dad also has a silenced 9mm with submachine gun. Whew. It stays at home with Corey in case something happens there while he's away. Both guns are German. Heckler and Koch. Dad has never said where he got the submachine gun. It's illegal, of course, so I don't blame him. It must have cost a hell of a lot. He's only had it from home a few times so he, Corey, and I could get the feel it fit. He'll do the same for the boys when they're older. Corey has an old Smith & Weston .38 revolver that she's good with. She's had it since before she married Dad. She loaned that one to me today. Ours aren't the best or the newest guns in the neighborhood, but they all work. Dad and Corey keep them in good condition. I have to help with that now. And they spend the necessary time on practice and in money on ammunition. In neighborhood association meetings, Dad used to push the adults of every household on to, to own weapons, maintain them, and know how to use them. Know how to use them so well, he said more than once, that you're as able to defend yourself at 2 a.m. as you are at 2 p.m. At first, there are a few neighbors who didn't like that. Older ones who said it was the job of the police to protect them. Younger ones who worried that their little children would find their guns. And religious ones who didn't think a minister of the gospel should need guns. This was several years ago. The police, my father told them, may be able to avenge you, but they cannot protect you. Things are getting worse. And as for your children, well, yes, there is a risk. But you can put your guns out of their reach while they're very young and train them as they grow older. That's what I mean to do. I believe they'll have a better chance of growing up if you can protect them. He paused, stared at the people, then went on. I have a wife and five children, he said. I will pray for them all. I'll also see to it that they know how to defend themselves. And for as long as I can, I will stand between my family and any intruder. He paused again. Now, that's what I have to do. You all do what you have to do. By now, there are at least two guns in every household. Dad, he said, Dad says he suspects that some of them are so well hidden, like Mrs. Sin's gun, that they wouldn't be available in an emergency. He's working on that. All the kids who attend school at our house get gun handling instruction. 
Once they've passed that and turned 15, two or three of the neighborhood adults begin taking them to the hills for target practice. It's kind of a rite of passage for us. My brother Keith has been whining to go along with whenever someone gets a shooting group together, but the age rule is firm. I worry about the way Keith wants to get his hands on guns. Dad doesn't seem to worry, but I do. I felt that. There are always a few groups of homeless people and packs of feral dogs living out behind the last hillside shacks. People and dogs hunt rabbits, possums, squirrels, and each other. Both scavenge whatever dies. The dogs used to belong to people or their ancestors did, but dogs eat meat. These days, no poor or middle-class person had an edible piece of meat would give it to a dog. Rich people still keep dogs, either because they like them or because they use them to guard estates, enclaves, and businesses. Rich people have, ex have other security devices, but dogs are extra insurance. Dogs scare people. I did some shooting today. I was leaning against a boulder watching others shoot when I realized there was a dog nearby watching me. Just one dog, male, yellow-brown, sharp-eared, short-haired. He wasn't big enough to make a meal of me, and I still had the Smith and Weston, so while he was looking me over, I took a good look at him. He was lean, but he didn't look starved. He looked alert and curious. He sniffed the air, and I remember that dogs were supposed to be more orient oriented more toward scent than sight. Look at that, I said to Joanne Garfield, who was standing nearby. She turned, gasped, and jerked her gun up to aim at the dog. The dog vanished into the dry bush and boulders. Turning, Joanne tried to look everywhere as though she expected more dogs stalking us, but there was nothing. She was shaking. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know you were afraid of them. She drew a deep breath and looked at the place where the dog had been. I didn't know I was either, she whispered. I've, I've never been so close to one before. I, I wish I had gotten a better look at it. At that moment, Arama screamed and fired her father's llama automatic. I pushed away from the boulder and turned, turned to see Aura pointing her gun towards some rocks and babbling. It was over there, she said, her words tumbling over one, one another. It was some kind of animal, dirty yellow with big teeth. It had its mouth open. It was huge. You stupid bitch. You almost shot me, Michael Talcott shouted. I could see now that he had ducked down behind the boulder. He would have been in Aura's line of fire, but he didn't seem to be hurt. Put your gun away, Aura, my father said. He kept his voice low. He, but he was angry. I could see that, whether or not Aura could not. It was an animal, she insisted. A big one. It might still be around. Aura, my father raised his voice and heart it not Aura looked at him, then seemed to realize that she had more than a dog to worry about. She looked at her god, at the, the gun in her hand, fumbled, found... <laughs> she looked at the gun in her hand, browned, fumbled it safe, and put it back in her holster. Mike, my father called. I'm okay, Michael Talcott said. No thanks to her. It wasn't my fault, Aura said right on cue. There was an animal. It could have killed you. It was sneaking up on us. I think it was just a dog, I said. There was one watching us over here. Joanne moved and it ran away. You should have killed it, Peter Moss said. What do you want to do? Wait until it jumps someone? What was it doing? Jay Garfield asked. Just watching? That's all. I said, it didn't look sick or starved. It wasn't very big. I don't think it's a danger to anyone here. There are too many of us, and we are all too big. The thing I saw was huge, Aura insisted. It had its mouth open. I went over to her because I had a sudden thought. It was panting, I said. They pant when they're hot. It doesn't mean they're angry or hungry. I hesitated, watching her. You've never seen one before, have you? She shook her head. They're bold, but they're not dangerous to a group like this. You don't have to worry. She didn't look as though she quite believed me, but she seemed to relax a little. The Moss girls were both bullied and sheltered. They were almost never allowed to leave the walls of the neighborhood. They were educated at home by their mothers, according to the religion their father had assembled, and they were warned away from the sin and contamination of the rest of the world. I'm surprised that, Allura, that Aura was allowed to come to us for gun handling instruction and target practice. I hope it will be good for her. And I hope the rest of us will survive. <laughs> all, you stay, all of you stay where you are, Dad said. He glanced at Jay Garfield, then went a short way up among the rocks and scrub oaks to see whether Aura had shot anything. He kept his gun in his hand and the safety off. He was out of our sight for no more than a minute. He came back with a look on his face that I couldn't read. Put your guns away, he said. We're going home. Did I kill it? Aura demanded. No, get on your bikes. 
He and Jake Garfield whispered something together for a moment. Then Jake Garfield sighed. Joanne and I watched them, wondering, knowing we wouldn't hear anything from them until they were ready to tell us. This is not about a dead dog, Harold Bolter said behind us. Joanne moved back to stand beside him. It's either about a dog pack or a human pack, I said, or maybe it's a corpse. It was, as I found out later, a family of corpses. A woman, oof, a little boy of about four years and a just born infant, all partly eaten. But dad didn't tell me that until we got home. At the canyon, all we knew was that he was upset. If there was a corpse around here, we would have smelled it, Harry said. Not if it was fresh, I countered. Joanne looked at me and sighed the way her father sighs. If it's that, I wonder we'll be shooting next time. I wonder when there'll be a next time. Peter Moss and the Talcott brothers had gotten into an argument over whose fault it was that Aura had almost shot Michael, and Dad had to break it up. Then Dad checked to see with Aura that she was all right. He said a few things to her that I couldn't see, and I saw a tear slide down her face. She cries easily. She always has. Dad walked away from her, looking harassed. He led us up the path out of the canyon. We walked our bikes, and then we all kept looking around. We could see now that there were other dogs nearby. We were we being watched by a big pack. Jay Garfield brought up the rear, guarding our backs. He said we should stick together, Joanne told me. She'd see me looking back at her father. You and I? Yeah, and Harry. He said we should look out for one another. I don't think those dogs are stupid enough or hungry enough to attack us in daylight. They'll go after some lone street person tonight. Shut up, for God's sake. The road was narrow going up and out of the canyon. It would have been a bad place to have fight off the dogs. Someone could trip and step off the crumbling edge. Someone could be knocked off the edge by a dog or by one of us. That would mean falling several hundred feet. Down below, I could hear dogs fighting now. We may have been close to their dens or wherever they lived in. I thought maybe we were just close to what they were feeding on. If they come, my father said in a quiet, even voice, freeze, aim, and fire. That will save you. Nothing else will. Freeze, aim, and fire. Keep your eyes open and stay calm. I replayed the words in my mind as we went up the switchbacks. No doubt Dad wanted us to replay them. I could see that Aura was still leaking tears and smearing and streaking her, her face with dirt like a little kid. She was too wrapped up in her own misery and fear to be of much use. We got almost to the top before saying anything. We were beginning to relax, I think. I hadn't seen a dog for a while. Then, from the front of our line, we heard three shots. We all froze, most of us unable to see what had happened. Keep moving, my father called. It's all right. It was just one of the dogs getting too close. Are you okay? I called. Yes, just come on and keep your eyes open. One by one, we came abreast of the dog that had been shot and walked past it. It was a bigger, grayer animal than the one I had seen. There was a beauty to it. It looked like the pictures I had seen of wolves. Okay. It was wedged against a hanging boulder just a few steeps, steps up at the steep canyon wall from us. It moved. I saw its bloody wounds as it twisted. I bit my tongue as the pain I knew it must feel became my pain. What to do? Keep walking? I couldn't. One more step and I would fall and lie in the dirt, helpless against the pain. Or I might fall into the canyon. It's still alive, Joanne said behind me. It's moving. Its forefeet were making little running motions, its claws scraping against the rock. I thought I would throw up. My belly hurt more and more until I felt skewered through the middle. I leaned on my bike with my left arm. With my right hand, I drew the Smith & Weston, aimed, and shot the beautiful dog through its head. I felt the impact of the bullet as a hard, solid blow, something beyond pain. Then I felt the dog die. I saw it jerk, shudder, stretch its long body, then freeze. I saw it die. I felt it die. It went out like a match in a sudden vanishing of pain. Its life flared up, then went out. I went a little numb. Without the bike, I would have collapsed. People had crowded close before and behind me. I heard them before I could see them clearly. It's dead, I heard Joanne say, poor thing. What, my father demanded, another one? I managed to focus on him. He must have skirted close to the cliff edge of the road to have gotten all the way back to us, and he must have run. The same one, 
I said, managing to straighten up. It wasn't dead. If we saw it moving. I put three bullets into it, he said. It was moving, Reverend Olamina, Joanne insisted. It was suffering. If Lauren hadn't shot it, someone else would have had to. Dad sighed. Well, it isn't suffering now. Let's get out of here. Then he seemed to realize what Joanne had said. He looked at me. Are you all right? I nodded. I didn't know how I looked. No one was reacting to me as though I looked odd, so I must have not shown much of what I had gone through. I think only Harry Bolter, Chris Talcott, and Joanne had seen me shoot the dog. I looked at them and Curtis grinned at me. He leaned against his bike in a slow, lazy motion, drew an imaginary gun, took careful aim at the dog, dead dog, and fired an imaginary shot. Pow! He said, just like she does stuff like that every day. Pow! Let's go, my father said. We began walking up the path again. We left the canyon and made our way down the street. There were no more dogs. I walked, then rode in a daze, still not quite free of the dog I had killed. I had felt it die, and yet I had not died. I felt its pain as though it was a human being. I felt its life flaring go out, and I was still alive. Pow. Wow, guys, that was a heavy chapter. Um, that really sobered up my mood. Um, I don't like guns. I'm not a big fan of guns. I'm a good shot, but I'm not a big fan of guns. Um, you know what I like even less than guns? Capitalism, taking advantage of people, imbalanced power structures. So let's get into it. This is um, Killing the Planet, How a Financial Cartel Doomed Mankind. This book fired me up, changed my life when I read it in 2019. And I was like, everyone... Excuse me. I burped. That was confirmation. <laughs> that everyone needs to know this book, needs to know this history. It's insane. These two guys, Rodney Howard Brown and Paul L. Williams, they put together so much information. Let's see if I can get the, here we go. The bibliography here is, it's not the most intense bibliography I've ever seen, but it's like a big one. Um, and basically all of these chapters, paragraphs right here, are just names and dates of people who's just screwed over the world for their own personal gain. So we're just doing one, one paragraph at a time, nice and see, easy little bite-sized samples of destruction. We're microdosing. <laughs> we're microdosing this book, okay? All right, so we're on page four, just the very beginning. A small side effect. Ah, so this is regarding to what we read yesterday with Dr. Livingston. Um, basically making snake oil poison to try to cure cancer, selling it at $25 a pint when most Americans earn $6 a week. So you do that math. A small side effect. But Dr. Bill warned that the concoction should not be administered to pregnant women since a few spoonfuls would likely cause an instantaneous abortion. As a physician, Levingston said, I am duty bound to warn you of this side effect. This side effect was always of interest to a few men, young men in the audience who were willing to empty their pockets for a small sampling of the medicine. A towering figure, you know what they're implying there? You realize what they're implying there, right? That these men would like non-consensually feed these women this poison to probably kill the baby that they implanted in that woman's womb and probably the woman at the same time from hemorrhaging from a miscarriage uh, with no medical medical help. Just saying, that's probably what happened. A towering figure with a thick auburn beard, Dr. Bill, wearing a top hat and a black waistcoat, spoke with a Sorona's voice and possessed a pleasing appearance and a magnetic charm that invoked confidence from his listeners. His medical show was successful enough for him to keep two wives, eight children, two separate households, and a stable of mistresses. Well, I did say one paragraph. I just said one paragraph, just a little bit of microdosing. So we'll get through it. We'll get through it. It's going to be good. We got one more reading for today, guys. It's the Empaths Empowerment deck. We got to end in a high note. You know, a little bit of self-love boundaries. Boundary up. Figure out what we can do to empower ourselves. To live the life that we know we want and that we can live. Um, all right. Oh, 
This one was at the bottom. It was stuck in the it was stuck in the thing. All the butterflies, all the golden butterflies, embrace your imperfections. Release the idea that you must be without flaws. Humans are imperfect, messy, and also miraculous. Simply aim to be the best person possible. You are the best person possible. Every day we are working very hard to be the best person possible, all right? That means a different thing for different people. Um, so you just have to be the best version of yourself. All right, I'm going to lead us in a little bit of a spinal roll because I need it. Um, and then let's get out of here because it's been a good day and we got things to do and it's a gorgeous day for me. I hope it's a gorgeous day for you and we all get to go outside. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of a spinal roll. We're just going to go down, leading with our head, going into the spine, going down, releasing energy back into the earth and then coming back up and bringing that wonderful golden yummy energy with us. Um, all right, let's get into it. You can also like do a little bit of like neck rolls first if you want to. I'm waiting for you to come stand up with me. So this is my invitation. Please stand up with me to do this. Uh, so we're just going to do a little bit of neck rolls. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you. Good. Mm, good person. Good. Good. I... Okay. Come on. Someone else help me out here. I need, I need some, fra maybe I'll find one on TikTok. I need a phrase that is like, not good girl, not good boy, but is like the same energy. <laughs> for my envies. That's what I need. Okay, let's do the spinal roll. Oh man, I just cracked my back. Let's do some like arm arm wheels. Yeah, let's do a little bit of this. Let's do a little bit of this. Let's like bring one arm up and over our head like this. Stretch out all along the sides. Let's go this way too. Oh, all right. That felt good, didn't it? Okay. Now we're gonna go into a spinal roll. One vertebrae at a time. Please do not move too quickly. Please do not try to shove yourself down. We, I don't want you to hurt yourselves here, okay? Alrighty. All right, so dropping in the head. That, yo, I'm gonna go this way. I washed myself back last night and I realized that it's kind of hard to see what I mean by the vertebrae. So we're just gonna drop with our head, with our neck down first like this. And then we're just going one vertebrae at a time with our shoulders. Just like this. And I also bend my knees a little bit. Don't straighten your knees, keep your knees bent. You don't wanna faint by keeping your knees straight and bending over. Oh, there we go, my back just cracked. So while we're hanging down here, woo, you can just hang. You can like swim your body in a big figure eight motion if you want to. Sometimes, oh, I try to crack my back again. And then when we're ready, plant your feet, stable on your feet. You know, we've got our knees here, bounce them. And then we're gonna straighten up our legs, kind of staying bent over. All right, so now our hips, our hips are stabilized. And we're just stacking one little vertebrae. Whoop, neck slip. One little vertebrae on top of the other until we're standing nice and strong and tall and powerful. Some good power poses, hands on the hips. Be strong, command, take up your presence, take up your energy. Another one, you know, roll this shoulder back, roll this shoulder back. Muscle man pose, I am strong. This is my life and I will conquer it. All right, just a little bit of power for you guys. I love you. You're amazing. You are so wonderful and glorious and holy and powerful and bright and wonderful and safe and protected and divine. You belong here. I'm so glad you're here. We need your energy here on this planet. All right. You were created with a beautiful divine light to share with the world. We need it. We need you. You need us. I love you. You take care. It is Friday. So I will see you back on Monday for another day of book club. Alrighty, I think that's enough for today. Let's go outside. Take care. Love you. Bye.